The New Hypocrite. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jordan. What's Wrong with the World? by G. K. Chesterton. Part 1. Chapter 3. The New Hypocrite. But this new cloudy political cowardice has rendered useless the old English compromise. People have begun to be terrified of an improvement, merely because it is complete. They call it utopian and revolutionary, that anyone should really have his own way, or anything be really done, and done with. Compromise used to mean that half a loaf was better than no bread. Among modern statesmen, it really seems to mean that half a loaf is better than a whole loaf. As an instance to sharpen the argument, I take the one case of our everlasting education bills. We have actually contrived to invent a new kind of hypocrite. The old hypocrite, Tartuff or Pecksniff, was a man whose aims were really worldly and practical, while he pretended that they were religious. The new hypocrite is one whose aims are really religious, while he pretends that they are worldly and practical. The Reverend Brown, the Wesleyan minister, sturdily declares that he cares nothing for creeds but only for education. Meanwhile, in truth, the wildest Wesleyanism is tearing his soul. The Reverend Smith of the Church of England explains gracefully with the Oxford manner that the only question for him is the prosperity and efficiency of the schools, while, in truth, all the evil passions of a curate are roaring within him. It is a fight of creeds masquerading as policies. I think these reverend gentlemen do themselves wrong. I think they are more pious than they will admit. Theology is not, as some suppose, expunged as an error. It is merely concealed, like a sin. Dr. Clifford really wants a theological atmosphere, as much as Lord Halifax, only it is a different one. If Dr. Clifford would ask plainly for Puritanism, and Lord Halifax ask plainly for Catholicism, something might be done for them. We are all, one hopes, imaginative enough to recognize the dignity and distinctness of another religion, like Islam or the cult of Apollo. I am quite ready to respect another man's faith, but it is too much to ask that I should respect his doubt, his worldly hesitations and fictions his political bargain and make-believe. Most nonconformists, with an instinct for English history, could see something poetic and national about the Archbishop of Canterbury as an Archbishop of Canterbury. It is when he does the rational British statesman that they very justifiably get annoyed. Most Anglicans, with an eye for pluck and simplicity, could admire Dr. Clifford as a Baptist minister. It is when he says that he is simply a citizen that nobody can possibly believe him. But indeed, the case is yet more curious than this. The one argument that used to be urged for our creedless vagueness was that at least it saved us from fanaticism, but it does not even do that. On the contrary, it creates and renews fanaticism with a force quite peculiar to itself. This is at once so strange and so true that I will ask the reader's attention to it with a little more precision. Some people do not like the word dogma. Fortunately, they are free, and there is an alternative for them. There are two things, and two things only, for the human mind, a dogma and a prejudice. The Middle Ages were a rational epoch, an age of doctrine. Our age is, at its best, a poetical epoch, an age of prejudice. A doctrine is a definite point. A prejudice is a direction. That an ox may be eaten while a man should not be eaten is a doctrine. That as little as possible of anything should be eaten is a prejudice, which is also sometimes called an ideal. Now, a direction is always far more fantastic than a plan. I would rather have the most archaic map of the road to Brighton than a general recommendation to turn to the left. Straight lines that are not parallel must meet at last, but curves may recoil forever. A pair of lovers might walk along the frontier of France and Germany, one on the one side and 
one on the other, so long as they were not vaguely told to keep away from each other. And this is a strictly true parable of the effect of our modern vagueness in losing and separating men as in a mist. It is not merely true that a creed unites men. Nay, a difference of creed unites men, so long as it is a clear difference. A boundary unites. Many a magnanimous Moslem and chivalrous crusader must have been nearer to each other, because they were both dogmatists than any two homeless agnostics in a pew of Mr. Campbell's chapel. I say God is one, and I say God is one, but also three. That is the beginning of a good, quarrelsome, manly friendship. But our age would turn these creeds into tendencies. It would tell the Trinitarian to follow multiplicity, as such, because it was his temperament, and he would turn up later with 333 persons in the Trinity. Meanwhile, it would turn the Moslem into a monist, a frightful intellectual fall. It would force that previously healthy person not only to admit that there was one God, but to admit that there was nobody else. When each had, for a long enough period, followed the gleam of his own nose, like the dong, they would appear again, the Christian a polytheist, and the Moslem a pan-egoist, both quite mad and far more unfit to understand each other than before. It is exactly the same with politics. Our political vagueness divides men. It does not fuse them. Men will walk along the edge of a chasm in clear weather, but they will edge miles away from it in a fog. So a Tory can walk up to the very edge of socialism, if he knows what is socialism. But if he is told that socialism is a spirit, a sublime atmosphere, a noble, indefinable tendency, why, then he keeps out of its way, and quite right too. One can meet an assertion with argument, but healthy bigotry is the only way in which one can meet a tendency. I am told that the Japanese method of wrestling consists not of suddenly pressing, but of suddenly giving way. This is one of my many reasons for disliking the Japanese civilization. To use surrender as a weapon is the very worst spirit of the East. But certainly there is no force so hard to fight as the force which it is easy to conquer, the force that always yields and then returns. Such is the force of a great impersonal prejudice, such as possesses the modern world on so many points. Against this there is no weapon at all, except a rigid and steely sanity, a resolution not to listen to fads, and not to be infected by diseases. In short, the rational human faith must armour itself with prejudice, in an age of prejudices, just as it armoured itself with logic, in an age of logic. But the difference between the two mental methods is marked and unmistakable. The essential of the difference is this, that prejudices are divergent, whereas creeds are always in collision. Believers bump into each other, whereas bigots keep out of each other's way. A creed is a collective thing, and even its sins are sociable. A prejudice is a private thing, and even its tolerance is misanthropic. So it is with our existing divisions. They keep out of each other's way. The Tory paper and the radical paper do not answer each other. They ignore each other. Genuine controversy, fair cut and thrust before a common audience, has become, in our special epoch, very rare. For the sincere controversialist is above all things a good listener. The really burning enthusiast never interrupts. He listens to the enemy's arguments as eagerly as a spy would listen to the enemy's arrangements. But if you attempt an actual argument with a modern paper of opposite politics, you will find that no medium is admitted between violence and evasion. You will have no answer except slanging or silence. A modern editor must not have that eager ear that goes with the honest tongue. He may be deaf and silent, and that is called dignity. Or he may be deaf and noisy, and that is called slashing journalism. In neither case is there any controversy, for 
the whole object of modern party combatants is to charge out of earshot. The only logical cure for all this is the assertion of a human ideal. In dealing with this, I will try to be as little transcendental as is consistent with reason. It is enough to say that unless we have some doctrine of a divine man, all abuses may be excused, since evolution may turn them into uses. It will be easy for the scientific plutocrat to maintain that humanity will adapt itself to any conditions which we now consider evil. The old tyrants invoked the past. The new tyrants will invoke the future. Evolution has produced the snail and the owl. Evolution can produce a workman who wants no more space than a snail and no more light than an owl. The employer need not mind sending a kaffir to work underground. He will soon become an underground animal, like a mole. He need not mind sending a diver to hold his breath in the deep seas. He will soon be a deep-sea animal. Men need not trouble to alter conditions. Conditions will so soon alter men. The head can be beaten small enough to fit the hat. Do not knock the fetters off the slave. Knock the slave until he forgets the fetters. To all this plausible modern argument for oppression, the only adequate answer is that there is a permanent human ideal that must not be either confused or destroyed. The most important man on earth is the perfect man who is not there. The Christian religion has specially uttered the ultimate sanity of man, says Scripture, who shall judge the incarnate and human truth. Our lives and laws are not judged by divine superiority, but simply by human perfection. It is man, says Aristotle, who is the measure. It is the son of man, says Scripture, who shall judge the quick and the dead. Doctrine, therefore, does not cause dissensions. Rather, a doctrine alone can cure our dissensions. It is necessary to ask, however, roughly, what abstract and ideal shape in state or family would fulfill the human hunger, and this apart from whether we can completely obtain it or not. But when we come to ask what is the need of normal men, what is the desire of all nations, what is the ideal house or road or rule, or republic, or king, or priesthood, then we are confronted with a strange and irritating difficulty, peculiar to the present time, and we must call a temporary halt and examine that obstacle. End of the New Hypocrite Recorded by Jordan